Welcome to the 2021 Colorado Health Symposium. I'm Amy Latham, Chief Impact Officer at the Colorado Health Foundation, and we are just about to get started. Before we do, we want to say a few words about language, just, language justice, which is the right for people to communicate in a language that's most comfortable for them. At the Health Foundation, we're on our own journey with regard to language justice, and part of that work is providing Spanish language interpretation at all of our community events. Our partner in this work is Community Language Cooperative. I'd like to invite Diana from CLC to join me here on stage to say a few words about interpretation and how it will work at today's event. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Diana y estoy aquí con mis colegas Itzel y Valentina por parte de la cooperativa de Community Language. Valentina nos acompaña el día de hoy virtualmente y será la traductora del chat. Estamos aquí porque los organizadores de este evento han hecho un compromiso con la justicia del lenguaje para poder proporcionar un espacio seguro donde todos pueden participar y escuchar en el idioma de su corazón. Haremos esto al proporcionar interpretación simultánea. Para poder acceder a la interpretación, haga clic en el icono de engranaje o configuraciones ubicado en la parte inferior derecha del reproductor para mostrar las opciones de reproducción. Desde este menú puede habilitar o deshabilitar los subtítulos en inglés, así como seleccionar su idioma de audio preferido para la reproducción, cual incluye español. Por favor, recuerde hablar con una velocidad conversacional al presentar para poder proporcionar una interpretación adecuada. Si tiene alguna pregunta o duda, por favor, mándela en el chat y Valentina estará lista para ayudarlos. Gracias. Hello, everyone. My name is Diana, and I am here with my colleagues Itzel and Valentina on behalf of the Community Language Co-op. Valentina is joining us today virtually and will be the chat translator. We are here because the organizers of this event have made a commitment to language justice to be able to create a safe space where everyone can participate and listen in the language of their heart. We will be doing this by providing simultaneous interpretation. To be able to access the interpretation, you can click on the gear icon located at the bottom right of the player to display the playback options. From this menu, you are able to enable or disable the English subtitles, as well as select your preferred audio language for playback, which includes Spanish. Please remember to speak at a conversational pace when presenting to be able to provide adequate interpretation. If there's any doubts or questions, please send them to us in the chat, and Valentina will be ready to help you out. Thank you all so much. Thanks so much, Deanna and CLC. The pandemic and so much more have dramatically affected all of us in our communities over the past 17 months. We gather today to reflect, to talk about what we've experienced in our communities, and to dream and plan and conspire about the future that we want to build together. Before we get into that conversation, though, we think it's really important to take a moment and remember the folks that we've lost in our communities across Colorado, across the country, and across the world. If you would, please join me in a brief moment of silence to remember those that we've lost. Thank you. We are extremely excited about being in this virtual community with you all today, and we have lots of great things planned over the next day and a half. It's really important to us that this event be accessible, inclusive, and as engaging as possible, even though we are not in the room together. So to that end, there are several things that I want to describe for you all in terms of ways that we have to engage. Uh, the first feature that I want to mention is that subti subtitling is available in English. To turn this feature on, you need to click the gear icon at the bottom right of the video player. As we just shared, we do have Spanish interpretation throughout the symposium. If you ask a question in Spanish for one of our speakers, our chat translator will translate it and the response. 
If you need support at any time throughout the event, please let us know via the chat function. We have several ways for you all to engage with us and each other and our speakers. All of these features are located on the lower right side of your screen. So the first one I'll talk about is the chat channel. I think all of us have gotten familiar with the chat function on various Zoom calls. This chat channel is for your public comments, reflections, and ideas that you want to share with all of the attendees. We don't have any sort of private direct messaging chat function. The next is the Q&A channel. This is where we encourage you to post your questions of us or our speakers throughout the event. We do want to point out that you can post your questions anonymously, and you can do this by uh, sliding the posting anonymously toggle to on. When the button turns green, you know that your question will be shared anonymously. The agenda feature will show you the schedule at a glance and allow you to keep up to date with the latest, uh, latest events and any changes that we might need to make to the schedule. The resource wall is where you can access and post helpful information, articles, tools, et cetera, that you think your fellow attendees might find useful. Okay, so that's your lower right. Shift your gaze to the top of your screen above the video player, and this is where you'll find the photo wall. We asked all of our registrants to share a photo with us that was representative of their experience of the past 17 months, and we got some great submissions. We encourage you to take a look at what your fellow registrants submitted, and also, if you didn't have a chance to share a photo, or if you'd like to share more, you can do that anytime during the event. Okay, this next one is very important. We're gonna talk a little bit about the polling channel, which we will be using throughout the symposium, and we're gonna test it out this morning to make sure that, you, that everyone is comfortable with using it. We'll prompt you to participate each time a poll is available. So, as I mentioned, we're gonna test this out right now. We ask you to click on the polls button and answer this question for us. What primary sector do you work in? And you can see the choices that we have available are advocacy, behavioral and mental health, community-based health care, early childhood, education, government, health care, and housing. So we are going to give folks a chance to submit their answers to that poll and see if we are able to get real-time results that we can report back out to the group. All right, the results are in, and my eyesight has really um, deteriorated over the past 18 months, so I'm going to have to... <laughs> it looks like the majority of our participants are with advocacy organizations, although we're still getting results in. Advocacy is still leading the way. All right. So most of us are from the advocacy sector, but we have a pretty good spread across different categories, including community-based health care, government, uh, health care, and education. So great, thank you very much for participating in the poll. All right, finally, I would be remiss if I did not encourage all of you to engage with us on social media using the hashtag 21CHS. All right, we're going to turn from the technical mechanisms for engagement, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the less tangible but just as important guidelines for our engagement over the next day and a half. We got input from our advisory committee and our staff about some group commitments that we'd like to share with you all today. The topics that we're going to be discussing are very important. They might be emotional, they might be sensitive for some people, and we want to make sure that there's a space for everyone to engage fully in these discussions. So here's what we are proposing in terms of group commitments. Everyone is welcome and everyone belongs. Communication and connection require vulnerability. Acknowledge people's lived experiences. 
Listen to understand, not to respond. Question ideas, not motives or individuals. And last, and my favorite, no one knows everything, but together we know a lot. So now we'd like to invite all of you using the chat channel to share any additional commitments that you think are important for us to keep in mind as part of this conversation that we're going to be having. If you share those with us in the chat channel, we'll collect them and we'll post the full, um, full uh, selection of uh, group commitments in the resources in the next day or two. Okay, now that we've covered all of the important logistical and engagement details, I am thrilled to introduce Mark Wallace to get us officially underway. Dr. Mark Wallace is a physician. He is the uh, Chief Medical Officer and CEO of North Colorado Health Alliance. He is the former Public Health Director at Weld County, and he is the Chief Clinical Officer at Sunrise. Mark wears a lot of hats, and we are extremely grateful at the Colorado Health Foundation that one of the hats that he wears is as our board chair. I'd like to welcome Mark to the stage. Thank you, Amy, and good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Wallace, CEO and Chief Medical Officer of the North Colorado Health Alliance and Chair of the Colorado Health Foundation's Board of Directors, all of whom send a warm welcome to you today from the various parts of the state they're joining us from. I'd like to thank the Board for their steadfast commitment to the Foundation and the great work each of you do to ensure we deliver on the promise of our mission to bring health and reach for all Coloradans. And to our symposium attendees, a big thanks to you for the tremendous, tireless work each of you do day in and day out to improve the lives of Coloradans. We know your time is valuable, and we're thrilled you've set aside some of it to join us for what I know will be an inspiring, rejuvenating, and productive couple of days. While the symposium is virtual this year, one thing hasn't changed. Folks are attending from every corner of Colorado, and I know all of us at the Foundation hope to be back together very soon in person. Speaking of every corner of Colorado, I have the great honor today to deliver a land acknowledgement. In the US, a land acknowledgement recognizes and respects Native Americans as their traditional stewards of the land and brings awareness and visibility to the original inhabitants, many of whom remain present in Colorado and are active leaders driving the hard, necessary work of social progress in our communities. At the foundation, we believe keeping equity at the center of our work will lead Coloradans to better health so that across the state, each of us can say, we have all we need to live healthy lives. In that vein, it's important that we understand our state's history and the lived experience of its inhabitants. These ideals are reflected in the cornerstones upon which our work is based. We do everything with the intent of creating health equity. We are informed by the community and those we serve. And we serve Coloradans who have less power, privilege, and income, and prioritize Coloradans of color. We acknowledge the land we stand on today because Indian history is American history and Colorado history. And that history is critical to our understanding of present day barriers to health and well being. Before this land became known as Colorado, it was the homeland and territory to many tribal nations, including but not limited to the Apache, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Lakota, Pueblo, Shoshone, and Ute. Other tribes whose territory sometimes extended into Colorado included the Comanche, Kiowa, and Navajo. Recognized in many circles as the crossroads of Indian country, Colorado was a site of trade, travel, gathering, and spiritual healing for these tribes, and is currently home to over 60,000 American Indian and Alaska Natives, including two federally recognized Indian tribes, the Southern Ute Tribe in Ignacio and the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe in Toyak. I'll close by saying that it is within our collective responsibility to be mindful and acknowledging of the history and experiences of Native people and the impacts on these communities' well-being. As a foundation, 
We are committed to continuing to build relationships with the Native American community in Colorado in pursuit of bringing health and reach for all. We're learning how to do that from the example many of you have demonstrated, and we thank you for your shared commitment. And with that, I'll turn things over to Karen McNeil Miller, President and CEO of the Colorado Health Foundation. Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you here. And I have got to start with giving thanks. Certainly, I give thanks the fact that my family has been healthy for the past 18 months. I hope you can say the same for yours. I give thanks for the air we breathe. I give thanks that we are all able to be in this place at this time. And I have so many other folks I want to thank for putting this event on that I had to write it down because I knew I might forget some folks. So first of all, absolutely the biggest thanks ever to the staff of the Colorado Health Foundation, particularly Jacqueline Linson, who took on this task a year ago. It has been a journey. I'm just going to, well, I'll just put a hard stop there. It has been a journey. And we can put all kinds of modifiers in there. It has been an exhilarating journey. It has been a stressful journey. It has been a challenging journey. And it has been a journey of learning and collaboration and love. And so I want to thank the staff and particularly thank Jacqueline. I also want to thank the Community Resource Center who have been our partners for a long time, particularly for their expertise in uh, rural Colorado. Windstar, Access Media Group, and Iconic Media, oh my goodness. Zane and Larry, thank you so much. You have been beyond patient with us as we learned this year, and we thank you for all you've taught us and all you are doing for us, even as we speak. Uh, the Community Language Cooperative, you met Deanna earlier. They're doing our uh, Spanish translation for us today. The Flowbots, who have been our friends for years, are here again with us this year. And they've even created a new group called the Synthesizers, just for us, just for you. Can't wait, and you'll be seeing them a little bit later this morning. Angel Perez from Colorado's um, uh, Circles for Change. I think you'll meet, you'll meet Angel tomorrow. And then we've got over a thousand registered, and I think we've got about 500 of you online now. I can't individually thank you, but we do want to individually recognize you. So use that chat function right now and type in your name, your organization or affiliation, and where you're dialing in from so that we can all recognize and thank you for what you've been able, for, for being able to join us today. And then I want to thank our advisory committee. These have been a group of people who have been in lockstep with Jacqueline and our staff for the past year helping us plan. These eight folks are from all around the state who are deeply themselves embedded in community and were helping us lift up the community voice in the planning of this uh, symposium. So I have great thanks for them. And now as we get started, I want to see how everybody's feeling. So let's use that chat button, I mean that polling function again. And I think there's a question that asks, how are you feeling? Are you feeling energized, hopeful, in need of inspiration, or in need of rejuvenation? For me, it would be depending on the day, but today I'm feeling energized and hopeful. So complete that poll and let's see how you're feeling and what you need. And there's only four choices, so actually I can actually read the results because the poll that Amy did, there were so many choices, the words were so small, I would have not been able to see. So let's see how everybody's feeling today from all across Colorado and hopefully, and I believe across the country. Let's see as the results start to pop up. Maybe you can't, you, maybe you can't decide how are you feeling. 
Let's see what we got. Well, I see some results are about to come up. I see the results of the last poll. Let's see the results of this poll. How are you feeling? Well, while we're waiting for that to come up, let me say that with over 1,000 registered and almost 500 folks on the line, um, it's, it would, it's not unusual that you all won't know who we are. So I wanna take a little bit of time to tell you a little bit about who we are as a foundation, and then we'll come back and check out the results. So as Mark Wallace said to you, our board chair, as Mark Wallace said to you, we are a Colorado Health Foundation. And you know what, while we're waiting for the poll results, I did wanna say this. I hope that every executive director, CEO, or president of a nonprofit out there is lucky enough to have a board like I have at the Colorado Health Foundation. This work of creating health equity through racial justice is hard work. And our boards can either pave the way or block the way. And I am so grateful that I have a board full of pavers and I'm excited to work with them every day and, and, and know that they um, are supportive of our work. All right, so now we've got the results. We've got a lot of hope out there. That's great hope and in need of rejuvenation, in need of inspiration. So we've got a lot of people who are feeling um, that they need to be refilled on something. And guess what? We got you covered. We got, we got you covered for the whole symposium for the whole two days. If you're already energized, we're gonna energize you even more. If you need rejuvenation, we got that for you. If you need inspiration, we got more than that for you. And if you need hope, we're gonna help each other in that because sometimes I, I fall into that hopelessness or, or feeling helplessness. So we got something for everyone. So now let me go back to telling you a little bit about the Colorado Health Foundation. So we're a statewide foundation focused on uh, our mission of improving the health of Coloradans. And we particularly focus on bringing health in reach for those who, for whom health is furthest in reach. And as Mark Wallace, our board chair said, we do that with using three cornerstones. We do everything, we do, everything we do is in, in uh, pursuit of health equity. We exist to serve Coloradans living with low income who are marginalized communities, have had little power privilege, and we prioritize Coloradans of color. And because we know communities are the experts on their lives, we don't do anything without talking to and being informed by those very communities. So, like everyone else, I'm sure, on this, that's on this channel, our lives for the past 18 months have been consumed with COVID. We've, we all had to rethink our North Star or recalibrate to our North Star. We had to say, what work did we have planned that we can that can, we can um, hold off on? What do we need to shift in order to respond to COVID? And the Colorado Health Foundation was no different. So how did we respond to COVID this past year? Well, over the past year, you see, we have invested over $46 million into the state of Colorado for, directly for COVID relief. Across all of our priorities, and bigger projects like the Governor's Relief Fund, the GAP Project, the fund at the Colorado Latino Foundation, the fund at the Women's Foundation. And what I am most proud of is that nobody had to complete an application to get those funds. Now, if we were in person, this is where there would be thunderous and endless applause at the fact of not having to complete an application. But we didn't have folks do that. We just sent emails and said, we're going to send you some money. And you wouldn't believe the people that 
called us back, called me back, or forwarded the email to me to say, Karen, someone is sending an email out under your signature, and we know it's a scam. We know it's spam. And I would call them back or talk to them and say, no, that's, that's real. You are going to get that $50,000, or you are going to get that $100,000. Well, what do we have to do to get it? Well, check your checking account next week. Or if we don't have your ACH uh, deposit number, then check your mailbox in a week. Well, what do you want us to do with it? We want you to do whatever you need to do to take care of your clients, your patients, your community at this time. And that's what folks did. And we are so proud to have been able to do that. Our board stepped up and uh, we did an additional 25% funding last year, so an additional $30 million invested in Colorado specifically for COVID. And we know COVID relief may be over, but COVID recovery is a long, a long way off, particularly for the communities that we care about. And now we are facing the vaccine time. We have been engaged with many of you in trying to get our communities vaccinated. We have been engaged in research that has taught us the, some ways in which to get to community that may not be the, the traditional ways we would have thought, that we have to spend time building trust in communities in ways and by people that might surprise us. So we've got to build trust. We have to answer their questions patiently and repeatedly and respectfully. And then we have to inspire hope, inspire hope in them of what it can mean for them, their family, their community, if they're vaccinated. I encourage you to go to the, uh, the link that's listed there to find out more about what you can do in your communities to try to help improve the vaccination rate because we need that for us to get out of, to get out of where we are now. And then last thing I'll share with you uh, as an introduction to us, particularly related to this time we're in now. We were already in conversations at the foundation about how we will deepen our equity focus. And we are deepening our equity focus by trying to achieve health equity through racial justice. Now, we do not believe that the Colorado Health Foundation is going to end systemic and structural racism. But we do think we have a role to play. We have a role to play in disrupting existing systems. And so what you see on the screen before you now is the framework that we, formal, that we identified of the role we could play alongside all of you. So certainly elevating power, activating power, and wielding power. In communities, we know communities inherently have power. Sometimes they don't. Um, know how to activate that power. Sometimes they need help to elevate that power to across the community. And then we as a foundation have power that we can wield and should wield and will wield. Partners that we identify, who we um, work with, not just our grantees, but also who we contract with, who are our vendors. How do we disrupt systemic racism uh, by how we choose our vendors, how we hire our staff. The money, of course, the resources, where the, who the money is given to, where the money goes. We will certainly be making a huge commitment to, to greater funding for BIPOC-led, BIPOC-centered organizations. They have historically been underfunded by philanthropy. The Colorado Health Foundation was guilty as well, but we're going to remedy that. And certainly there remain white-led organizations, majority-led organizations that center on people of color. We want to deepen those relationships as well. The policies and practices, and the, the two I want, to, I want to talk about specifically related to this symposium, policies and practices. How can we help advance just and more just policy and practices. What can we learn with each other? What can we learn from each other? We're gonna spend time today and tomorrow talking about 
potential policies and practices and advancing the conversation. Advancing the conversation about racial justice, about health equity, what it means, how we can begin to address it. So that's a little bit about who we are. And now let's talk about where we are. So here we are. Of course, last year we could not do our annual symposium that most of you know about and most of you probably have attended in Keystone. We had to cancel that because we all shut down in March. We had to cancel our July event. And then as, because it takes us a year to plan for something like that, we also knew or believed that we would not be able to this year gather 600 people, 700 people again in Keystone. And so we knew we would have to do something different for this symposium. And it gave us an opportunity because I've been looking for a way to host more regional events. So I went to Jacqueline and our team and I said, well, how about for next symposium we do a regional symposium? And uh, in, in, in community. And she said, oh, okay. And I said, well, really, I was thinking we would do like multiple convenings across the state. And she said, okay. And I said, you know, really, I mean multiple convenings simultaneously across the state. And of course, we'll still do uh, some virtual. And after she counted to 10 twice, she said, okay. And thus began a year of planning that a week ago, we had to shift. So that's why I am standing on the stage in an empty auditorium in Denver, or in Glendale, uh, Glendale actually, and you're not here, nor are you in Greeley, or Glenwood Springs, or Durango, or Pueblo, where we intended to have these events. You're home, you're at work, because that dastardly Delta variant is rearing its head. And out of an abundance of caution, we needed to go virtual. So in a week, we took five simultaneous in-person events and made one virtual event. And it's gonna be exciting. So we are going to extend the conversation that we've been having for the past four years at these symposia. We had a conversation on the intersection of race and health. Then we had a conversation on the intersection of housing and health and race. And now, given the year we've all had, given the year where COVID has consumed, dominated, and dictated our lives completely for the past 15 or 16 months, we're gonna have the conversation t today and tomorrow about the intersection of COVID, health, race, and racial justice, all in, the, all in the pursuit of health equity. So it's gonna be a great conversation. We know that while we had hoped by this time the pandemic would be subsiding, it did subside and now is starting to crank back up a little bit. But we know whenever the actual pandemic itself is over, the effects of the pandemic on the people and the communities that we care about, the people in communities that you care about, and the people in communities in which you live, the, the impact, the tail of that impact is gonna be for years. And we have to be at the ready, ever ready, to persist and proceed in our work. So we've got wonderful um, uh, speakers, we've got artists, and we've got a, a symposium and sessions design that can help keep us energized, rejuvenate us, give us hope, give us direction, give us tools. So I'm excited about what there we have to go for the next few days. I am um, excited for the opportunity to be with all of you, and we're gonna, gonna get ready. So I'm going to 
we're going to take a minute now, because of the last year we just had, we're going to take a collective pause. And I'm going to invite Stefan, aka Br'er Rabbit, from the Flowbots to join me here on stage to lead us in this collective pause. Good morning, my friends. So good to be here. Nice for you to be here with us. So if it's cool with everybody, can we actually just take a collective breath? So we'll breathe in for a count of four and then breathe out for a count of eight, okay? So let's go ahead, breathe in. Out. Thank you. Karen. Yes. It is always amazing to see you thank in you. any circumstance. Thank you. Um, thank you for holding it down like you always do. Um, and thank you for being the representative of this work for justice in this state. Thank you. It is massive. But um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this last year, if, if you don't mind. Um, this last year has been actually a very unifying year. For many of us, as far as we all know, it's been a year of challenge. But even though we've all been challenged, I don't think many of us know what the challenge has been for each of us. Mm -hmm. So in this past year of challenge, what is something about your challenging year that you'd like me and everybody else to know? Um, thank you for, for saying I, you think I've been holding it down. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm just trying to hold it together. Mm. So this past year, um, I think probably in the last 18 months, I've cried more than I have in the past 10 or 15 years. And I don't think people know, I know my, even my husband doesn't know the number of times I just um, broke down mm -hmm. in tears in my office or in the bathroom or in the basement after everybody had gone to bed. Um, some, were, some were tears of joy, but there weren't many tears of joy. The, but there were lots of um, tears of frustration, tears of feeling helpless, tears of sadness for people that I know that lost family members, friends I know that lost family members, just the world that kept losing family members that couldn't grieve. There were um, tears of rage sometime. So the tears, um, I had a tearful, I had a tearful year. During that year, you still did the work, like so many people within this organization, like so many people in these communities. They showed up and did the work. So I want to ask, like, how did you keep, keep on keeping on? Like, was there, was there a song that you would go to as a source of strength during this time? Well, I keep on keeping on, as I think everybody else does, because we have to. Yes. We, we are called to, we are driven to, and we are meant to, so we keep going. There is a song that I would always go to, and it was um, Sam Cooke's Change Is Gonna Come. That was my, was my go-to song. Do you mind sharing some of it with us? You mean sing it? Yes. <laughs> Um, I will try. I'll, I'll try the first and last verse. Okay. I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, just like that a river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know change gonna come oh yes 
yes, it will. There were times when I thought I couldn't last for long, but now I think I'm able to carry on. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Thank you, Karen. Oh, man. I was asking you about that song because so much of what we're talking about today are ways that we reflect on what's happened and reinvent. And some of those ways are being able to use technologies, tools that are at hand. So it's as simple as sometimes calling people or remembering a song that you've been singing for strength that connects you to the struggle of your people and also connects you to the hope for the future. Change is gonna come and it has been coming. And I think that's just so beautiful. But that, that, that song is so perfect for right now. So let me ask you. Oh no. Um, how's your year been? Oh, okay. Um, it has been challenging. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me was actually slowing down enough to realize that I was challenged. I think in some way I was trying to just kind of get through this, uh, take care of my people, take care of my household, do what we needed to do. Um, that I didn't take much time to look and be like, oh, I'm suffering. I'm, I'm not apart from this. I am a part of this. And when that happened, then the tears came. Mm -hmm. um, but then also more honest conversations happened. And when I realized that I was hurting, it was easier for me to see the humanity of other people. Um, maybe folks who made different decisions around how to follow different quarantine protocols. Before, it was easy for me to villainize them. Um, after I started checking in with myself, I saw like, oh, they're just suffering in another way. Um, so what can I do? And it took a while, but in that, then it became easier to be like, oh, well, there's a lot of matriarchs in my neighborhood who are going at it alone. Can I deliver some flowers to them just to let them know that I see them since I can't come and hug them and such? Can I help maintain some lawns? And then so after do doing all that, I actually got to see that there was many roles that I could still play in my community. There's something I could still do. Um, I wasn't helpless or hopeless or worthless. Um, and even though certain things were taken away, there were still other opportunities to show up and be the person that I always needed to be. But that was the challenge, was actually being aware that I was suffering. Mm -hmm. That was the hard part. And did you have a go-to song? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it's a song that my mother used to sing, um, especially during chemotherapy, mm -hmm. it was a song that we'd sing together. Um, it's a song that my family has sung in times of trial. And it goes like this. It's um, called, I Feel Like Going On. I feel like going on. I feel like going on. Though trials come on every feel like going on. It's beautiful. I feel like going on. I feel like going on. The
Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Um, I just want to say that we are looking at all the different ways that we can bring our voices together here. Um, what has been set up, the whole organization has been incredibly nimble. And Karen, thank you again. Thank you. Um, in finding ways to synthesize our voices. So we will be your synthesizers today. We are Ryan Fu, Chrissy G, Michelle Rocket, James Laurie, also known as Johnny Five, Lady Larie Soul, and I am Stephen Brackett, also known as Br'er Rabbit. And what we're here today doing is looking at ways that we can bring in creativity, listening, and just bring together all of the beautiful offerings that this community has. So we are honored to be here. We're going to be here with you for the rest of the conference, and we'll be uh, poking our heads in with uh, reflections, artistic pieces, and ways that we're synthesizing what we're hearing. So thank you. We will be involving music. We'll be asking you about your songs, the songs that have gotten you through. We'll be asking you about the songs of your community. Um, we'll be talking to you about the role that music plays and that your story plays in your life. And while we're on this stage, um, and because we have some more time, I wanted to, to see if I could hand it off to uh, Lurie and Chrissy of Spirit of Grace uh, to share an incredibly important song uh, that speaks to the history of an entire people. Wherever you are, you can join us by standing as we sing the Black National Anthem. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let God of our weary 
Thank you so much for sharing with us. You may be seated. Hi, I'm Michelle Rocket. And I just want to take the opportunity to reflect on the questions that Stefan and Karen were talking about, which is maybe get a journal or maybe in the notes in your phone or maybe just in your head and you've already been thinking about, we're going to ask you to think of a song that has gotten you through the last year, year and a half something that speaks to your experience. And when you have that song, put it in the chat for us, for us to have and look at. Um, we're gonna go into a break right now, but stay close, because there will be music during this break. Uh, stretch, stay nearby. Um, the first of which is actually a song that I wrote called Interview. So, see you soon.
Navigating the multiple pandemics last year was really challenging, professionally and personally. But personally, I think it was more challenging when your nine-year-old son, Aiden, says to me, I have no friends, mom. He hadn't been at school in over a year. How do you motivate your nine-year-old son? And you just say, hold on, change is coming. Yesterday, I can't sing. A man said to me, how can you smile when the world is crumbling down? I said, here's my secret. When I want to cry, I take a look around and I see that I'm getting by. Hold on. Change is coming. Hold on. My name is Kalina Snusom, and I'm a senior program officer at the Colorado Health Foundation. Um, when I think about the challenges that were experienced um, in 2020 and even parts of 2021, um, I think about uh, a song um, that really, I think, got me through um, the pandemic and being isolated um, from folks, and then also just the systemic racism and injustices that really, I think, um, impacted us all. I think about um, an artist by the name of Tasha Cobbs. I spend a lot of time in church. I lead worship at my church. And Tasha Cobbs is a gospel artist who um, has a song called This Is A Move, and I'm going to play a few seconds of it. So an amazing song um, and a song that just really encouraged my soul and it still does. So um, thank you for letting me share. And again, my name is Kalina Snusom, Senior Program Officer at the Colorado Health Foundation. When the world gets us down, my family and I have a dance party. Our favorite song is Pambalaka, an Ingoli song readapted by Playing for Change. This song connects us to our roots and reminds us of how big and beautiful the world is. It shows people coming together, celebrating their cultures and uniqueness.
My name is Panama Soweto. I'm a Denver-based poet and musician. During the 2020 quarantine of Black Lives Matter protests, my friends and I took to the studio to record an album to give voice to issues important to us as black fathers. Hey, 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 hey. You got to need some of that ops. Hey, you kill me, we gonna march ops. Hey, you wanna know where the fire starts? Hey, you the one with the torch ops. Hey, you wanna squeeze till my breath stops? Hey, put my baby in a sweatshop. Hey, take away my mama health care. Hey, put my brother in hey, a cell block. Hey, hey, you want me to roll with these punches, huh? You want me to fold under pressure? Take a look at this nation and the faces that make it tell the truth. Now who's the soul of the sport and sports and entertainment? Every promise that you came with's been a ruse for the acres and the mules. How you gonna make it great again? We have to decide what we want to see, which desires we want to affirm as we. We have to consider who we want to be, what defines and guides us as we call our country free. We have to decide. Hay que decidir que intenciones queremos in this Nike Pepsi beer commercial fantasy we see on television. Let's be clear, there's a war on for our minds. And one weapon is fear. Una guerra de las mentes nos atacan con temor y con tantas fantasías. And at our country's borderlines, we implement Implement decisions based on who we think we are. In las fronteras vemos quienes somos. Si vamos a gritar a los que quieren trabajar por muchas horas y cuidar a sus niños y familia, that's horribly bizarre. If we yell at those who want to raise a family and work hard, then what are the alternatives? Hay que considerar las alternativas. Would we prefer people's children starve? Preferimos que no coman? Hay que orientarnos en el mundo que queremos construir en el futuro. Which values do we value? And how can we secure those? Cuando los valores más básicos de la vida conflictuan con las leyes y con la política, entonces la pregunta, the question here remains ¿Cuál tiene que cambiar? And which one has to change? We have to decide what we want to see which desires we want to affirm as we we have to consider who we want to be, what defines and guides us as we call our country free Hay que decidir qué queremos ver, qué valores hay que defender y crecer, ¿me entienden? Aunque sea indocumentado, si se puede, undocumented dreams must be made possible today. Y para los que pidan por justicia, ashe. And for all those who plead for justice, love will find a way. Y para los con miedo del cambio, yo sé. I know that change can make us all afraid, but when you see the truth about the history of this water, air, and land, el agua y el aire y la tierra where we stand, comprende Que no somos separados. We are one human family, tree con raíces sagrados. A tree can be a weapon or a wall, a shelter or a source of sustenance. A family can wound you in a dozen different tongues. But no matter where you're from, you're here now. And when the world's turned upside down, the soil's fertile ground. Entonces, hoy que planteamos, que sembramos en el campo, que vamos a crecer, how can we grow together? Ambos manos sostienen poder, the power you hold, and we hold, the people, el pueblo unido. Hold on, just a little while longer. Hold on, just a little while longer. Hold on, just a little while longer. Oh, everything will be. Just a little while longer. Pray on. Just a little while longer. Pray on. Just a little while longer. Everything will be alright. Fight on. Just a little.
Thank you both so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Ryan Fu. I'm director of operations over at the Black Actors Guild. And I can tell you firsthand that the last year has been hard for performers. It's been tough for everybody, but especially those in the creative industry. It's been tough to see our communities just evaporate, you know? All of the places we called home, our venues, our stadiums, our backyard parties, suddenly they were places to be afraid of. And as such, I think it's really important that we model a little bit of what we're asking you. Um, so again, my name is Ryan. I'm gonna ask each of us as we go down the line to just share a little bit about who we are and answer the first question that we pose to you. And that question is, what is a challenge that you went through that you want other people to know about through this last year? Because obviously we all went through COVID or are going through COVID. But what we've been through individually is pretty remarkably different. So I'm going to pose that question down here on the far right, and we're going to go this direction. Um, I'm Laurie from Spirit of Grace. Um, one of the challenges that I went through, one of the things that was most difficult for me um, was not only was I not able to sing, and singing is my air, it's my lifeblood, it's my everything. But when I was able to sing, it was for so many funerals for so many of my friends and their family members. And when your job is to bring joy through music to people and, and you find that the only thing you can do is bring comfort uh, through music to people, it, it was very taxing, it was very trying on me. And so um, I was so grateful the first time that I was able to just sing to sing and not to sing to comfort or to sing to bury, but just to sing to make the music that makes me so happy, that makes me feel real. Um, that, was, that was one of the best things that happened. It was like, like starving and finally having food again, to be able to just sing for the love of music. So that's something that I went through um, that I would like to share because if you're not an artist, if you're not a musician, you don't know that what we did during the pandemic was, was comfort those who were dying. Thank you for sharing, and I think I speak on behalf of this whole audience and everyone online where I say thank you for returning to that which brings so much joy and power and love and grace. I mean, you guys are incredible, so thank you for being here. Jamie? Yeah, so um, in addition to not being able to perform, uh, I a lot of the time that actually these days I find most meaningful is, is being involved, I volunteer with a group um, in Aurora that serves refugees called Project Worthmore, and I go there for me. I go there because people from all over the world, are, from very different communities, are bringing um, their traditions and their sense of community together into one place. And yes, people are learning English, yes, people are being served through a food share, but it's a place where um, you know, a, a single smile across a language barrier can just brighten up the room. And you know, I was just in the middle of sort of creating some spaces where we could do that in across language barriers, do that together in unexpected ways across all these different things that people tell us are divisive lines, but they really aren't. And you know, having to cancel you know two months worth of those activities, um, and then of course if, you know that continuing on for a whole year, um, I think I just went numb for a while. And there, you know, I was I was in. I was in quarantine when everyone else was in quarantine. I was, you know, certainly finding the silver linings of this time with myself and this time uh, to do things I hadn't had time to do, but I was feeling increasingly sort of hollow and, and, and just there was something frozen. And it's only as I've been able to reconnect with people that I've realized that that kind of community connection that sometimes we tell ourselves we're volunteering to help others, that's not what that's for. Um, that is because I desperately needed that sense of community um, in a country where that's a resource we have too little of, especially Absolutely. compared to so many cultures around the world um, who will look at us and say, wow, you, you put your parents in, in a special building away from everybody else. You, you hear that anytime you travel or talk to somebody from um, so many different cultures. So. Um, the elders, the, the time with elders in the community, the time with so many loved ones, um, 
I was atrophying without that. And that's something I, I don't know if people understand and I want people to know. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing, Jamie. I'll, I always remember the Dalai Lama quote where when people come to the Dalai Lama, they ask, why am I not happy? He says, well, have you helped anyone today? Right? It's, it is for you. So thank you for helping and doing it for you. Michelle? Uh, I think a challenge that I went through was learning this process of solitude and how that's different from isolation or how that's different from um, separating yourself. So solitude is the practice of being with yourself and uh, learning how to be in that and learning how to love yourself enough to enjoy that and to be fulfilled by that is uh, was more of a challenge than I anticipated. Mm. Um, I am an introvert, so I, I loved recharging on my own, but uh, being with myself was a new experience. And also I learned in that uh, my relationship to work and overworking. And um, I learned this last year that we are not measured by our productivity and we're not measured, our value does not come from the work that we do. Um, we have inherent value. Like if we just stay at home for ever and ever, we still have value. Um, it doesn't mean, so that's, that was a challenge that I had to confront in the last year. Um, and I'm happily trying to get to the other side. Yeah, so. I think you're on the other side of it. You've done uh, fantastic. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah, well done. <laughs> well, we're running out of time, but Stefan, we're going to hear all from throughout the course of this because we have to move on to our next thing. But we just want to let you know that we're in this process with you. We're answering the same questions. We love you, and we'll see more of you soon. I hope you had a break, but I also hope you weren't too far away that you couldn't hear um, the beautiful music and the poetry that we heard. And before we move on to our next session with these two beautiful and wonderful people, I just want to um, everybody to look in my eyes and listen to what I'm saying. I do not want to see any video on social media of me singing. I don't want to see any memes. I don't want to see any GIF. If you do, I will hunt you down. So just be warned. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to have a conversation with two uh, beautiful people. I don't, don't think we're ready to pull them up on the screen. Uh, Dr. Janetta Cole will be joining us and Howard Ross. Good morning, beautiful ones. The top of the morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. Dr. Cole, I hear you just got a new computer. Huh? Well, actually, it's an old computer. <laughs> We're just trying to make it work correctly. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to introduce you to, to everyone. So we have Dr. Janetta Cole, who uh, is... Uh, president Emeritus of Bennett College and, amongst other things, President Emeritus of Bennett College and Spelman College, the only two black women HBCUs, uh, his, uh, historically black college and university, and she's the only person to have led both. And she has been a shero of mine for many, many years. And now I have a new friend, Howard Ross, who has spent a career working on and understanding and helping us understand diversity, unconscious bias. And somehow life brought them together and, and they are advancing their work together. So good morning to both of you. Morning. It's a joy to meet you, Sister Yeah, and, and just had to take a moment to give a shout out to those young artists who were just on, yeah. and not just for their music, but for their wisdom as well. 
So I'm going to tell the folks in the room, I can't hear what Howard Ross is saying. I can understand Dr. Cole, but I can't hear um, what Howard is saying. So Dr. Dr. Cole, I want to start with you, and thank you both for joining us for this conversation. Now, when we did our pre-meeting uh, the other day, the two of you call each other sis and bro. Tell me how that came about. Well, I'd love to begin by saying that I'm an anthropologist. I am getting feedback. I don't know if we can correct. Anyway, I'm an anthropologist. So I know a lot about kinship. I can talk complicated kinship charts. But here is something I know that is easy to understand. Kinship is about more than descent and marriage. Kinship is also about values, dreams. And so I refer to Howard Walsh as my brother, just a way of saying brother. I'm saying that I know through his actions that we share an enormous amount. Our values are fundamentally the same. So I call him bro also because at least in anthropology, when you use a kinship term, you're calling forth from that a certain kind of behavior. So I know if things got really difficult and I needed somebody to stand right by me and get me through it, how would would act like my brother. Oh, that's beautiful. And I know you, like me, are from the South, so we, we know about kinfolk. Yes. <laughs> and so you and Howard are kinfolk. Howard, let me ask you, um, you've been doing this work on unconscious bias and diversity for a long time. How did you come to find that work, or how did that work find you? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a good question. It's, it's a little bit like, I remember uh, I was in Malaysia, and uh, we took us to a temple that was pretty much run by monkeys. And they showed us the way that they capture monkeys sometimes. They take a clay pot and dig it in the ground with this big open top open, and they put cherries in. And then when the monkey slides their hand in and grabs the cherries, because they've made a fist, they can't pull their hands out. And so they sit there trying to pull their hands out until somebody comes and throws a net over them. And at that moment, uh, you wonder whether the monkey has the cherries or the cherries has the monkey. Um, I think my uh, journey into social justice work was very much the same way. Um, I was with a family January 1991, just five years after the end of the Holocaust. And uh, we suffered from this family loss. And so it was in my family that we had to do something about that. Terrible things could happen to people. We were responsible for doing something about it. So I didn't start acting until I was about 14 or 15 years old, but there's no question that it was the ethos of my family there. So let me double check. Dr. Cole, can you hear now? Are you able to hear? It's, it's not clear from how I get feedback I from myself and my bow is breaking up. Okay. I think we're, have, we're both having the same problem with kind of understanding what Howard is, is saying. So they're gonna, work, they're gonna work on that on this end. We, this whole conference, it's Dan tomorrow, we're, we're drawing the connection between our last year of COVID, uh, its connection to, of course, health, but race and racial justice. And we're always looking, the folks who are, on the, who are on the line are all 
most already in the work, doing the work, but always looking for ways to help explain the work, particularly to those who aren't, who are resistors or who are just uninformed or misinformed. How would you draw the connection between this last year of COVID, health, race, racial justice? I will begin by saying, I often refer to this last year that we've been in as a year of three pandemics. Not one, not two, but three. Of course, the first is the worst health crisis that we have endured as a nation since 1918. But that health crisis has had enormous economic consequences which I can summarize by saying those with the most challenging economic circumstances became even more challenged. And then the third pandemic is, of course, this outpouring of systemic racism that we so hoped we put aside in the early civil rights movement. And so for those who have been most, I'm gonna use a heavy word, attacked prior to the pandemic, they in fact have suffered disproportionately. Let me be specific. This means that black Americans, it means that indigenous people it certainly means elderly people. People in all marginalized communities have suffered and continue to suffer. And I would also say that when we watch the lynching of George Floyd, and we also call her name Brianna we call the name of so many of our sisters and brothers who have been the victims of police violence. When we call those names, if we gave the entire list, then we would say this is of pandemic proportions. When I was growing up in the same way that you did, Sister Karen, in the South, we had a saying in terms of the health question. It was this. When white folk have a cold, black folk have walking pneumonia. And so when you look at health equity and inequity, we can say that the pandemic involving the coronavirus has simply exacerbated, it has exaggerated what is a long-standing situation of inequity in terms of health. So Howard, so how, I like that um, notion of the, of the three pandemics. We had the COVID, we had an economic pandemic, and we had a racial justice pandemic. What else would you add to that? And how would you, how do you draw this, the thread between all of those things? Well, first of all, is, can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay, good. Um, I think that, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the last year about systemic racism. And this term is very controversial. Some people Try to shut down this conversation. But I think it, we can only really understand the impact of COVID, especially on Black and Brown communities in our country and Native Indigenous communities, see it in, in this systemic racism. So many of the factors that ended up impacting communities of color um, are related to this. For example, the fact that so many more African Americans are in jobs that we consider essential jobs. So people who are delivery people, people who are stocking shelves, you know, people who are doing those kinds of jobs who had to get out into the marketplace 
and continue to work when a lot of us were staying, were staying safe. Um, uh, the fact that people live in highly dense communities that often are taken care of as much as other communities and therefore have higher pollution levels. So for example, bus depots, truck depots, parking depots, communities, that, that for, for a uh, disease that deals with the lungs, of course, that becomes exacerbated. The fact that the black and brown people generally earn less money, have less acquired wealth than white people in their culture, means that some people who might have stayed home, even if it cost them money, could not afford to do that. You know, or even get access in the early days to some of the basic services we need. I mean, we could go on and on, of course, but I think what we see here is how all of these factors contribute to something like a pandemic hitting people's health, even though we don't necessarily think of them as being directly associated with it. And that's what I think is so important for people to understand about this concept of systemic racism, is that a lot of times people hear systemic racism, they think what people are saying is, can you not hear me now? I see Dr. Coles. Coles. Oh, now I'm back. Yeah, sorry about that. What I was saying, I think something that's really important to understand about this concept of systemic racism, it's not about saying a person is a racist and over a racist. It's about saying that the systems that we live in, the structures of these systems, are built on hundreds of years of benefiting one group to the detriment of another or to others, and that that shows up at times like this when we have something like COVID. Yes, I, I agree. One of the things I think we all here and those that we are, uh, the, the folks that are listening, we really try to make the distinction between uh, that we're not talking about individual racists, but racism. We're not talking about white supremacists, but white supremacy. And that those are Very important. the ones st structural, and it's the structural part that is um, the blocking, accounting for deci individual decisions that people make. People could make every right decision and still be faced with the block that is a structural block. Yeah, we see a combination here of two things working together. We have systemic processes that produce bias in our system because they position one group as better than another. And then the bias, of course, becomes the connective tissue of the system. So they're like co-joined twins, that both of them support each other in existing. Yes, Dr. Cole. Yes, I just wanted to say that for so many of our sisters and brothers in the United States of America, this last year has pointed to the exceptional, the unfortunate set of circumstances that happened when racism and sexism intersect. The intersectionality of those two systems of oppression means that Black women, Latinas, our sisters who are of the Asian Pacific Islander community, our indigenous sisters, are suffering what we call from a double jeopardy. And so I was moved to say this as I listened to my brother Howard talking about the number of people who were on the front lines during this pandemic. They were not only people of color, they were in large proportions, people of color who are women. And while I'm saying that, let me just sneak in here if I can, that each of us has multiple identities. You know, I need to be described by my race, whatever that is. The fact that I'm a cis woman, that's my gender identity. You can describe me in terms of a religious affiliation or none? Certainly my age? Am I poor or not? And so what I want to make clear here is that we've got an enormous amount of work to do 
to fix what has been haunting us for 401 years, and that is systemic oppression based on what we call race, but yes, also based on gender, based on age, based on nationality, based on ability or disability. And yet, one of the many things that I admire now that I've gotten to know a little bit more about the Colorado Health Foundation is that while understanding these multiple identities, you have nevertheless seen the importance of focusing heavily on systemic racism. Yes. So Howard, I, I could tell you were having some difficulties a moment ago. Can you hear now? Yeah, I can hear now. There's yeah, All right, so as I was explaining to everyone when we first started, this is we've first time we've ever done something like this, so please give us grace and have patience with us as we, as we figure it out. And I also want to say to the folks online, if you have questions that you want to ask of Dr. Ross, um, of, of uh, Howard Ross or Dr. Cole, put them in the chat function. Folks are going to funnel them to me, and then we're not going to have a separate question and answer uh, period. We'll try to fold them in. So go ahead and put in your questions if you want. You know, there's one other factor I think that when we talk about COVID is so important. That is, it, it, and it's showing up in you know, um, tragically low numbers of people who have gotten vaccinated in some community we call around the country. And that is a time of distrust government programs when they're focused, on, especially the black community. And when people think back to you know, some of the famous examples of the Tuskegee study and things like this, there's, a, there's an understandable suspicion of the government and what the government's doing and has done over decades and decades uh, with healthcare to this community. And so we can understand how some people would be more suspect of things that the government are offering. And so once again, this comes into the present. You know, we've got lots of folks um, watching who are in rural communities. Uh, you know, Colorado as a state is a predominantly white state, and we certainly got rural communities that may be 80, 85 percent white. And the, our colleagues in those communities are having difficulty how to broach the conversation, because if they walk into those communities using the words oppression, using the words white supremacy, the conversation doesn't even start, much less it ends, it doesn't start. So how would you recommend folks approach those conversations in communities like that? How do we start the conversation and advance the conversation and help generate understanding? Bro, you've written a book about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, bro, come on, tell us. I, I, you know, I, I think one of the things we have to do as practitioners is we have to manage our own state. You know, a lot of us who are in this field, who are doing work on diversity and inclusion, are doing it out of our own personal wounding or wounding from a family history. You know, I shared my experience, my family experience, the Holocaust, how important that's been in terms of my doing the work that I do. And I know that that's true for many, many people as well. Now, the challenge of that is that we're not careful we're coming from that wounding and the energy that gets created with the people we're working with is you have to change so that I can feel better. And that's not a healthy place to come from when you're facilitating people's learning, you know? And, and, and it's like an old teacher of mine used to say, when you go fishing, you bite the hook with what the fish likes to eat, not what you like to eat. And so I think what we have to do is we have to find the language not to be too fixated on saying the words that we want to say all the time, but to find ways to get the concepts across. And one way to do that is by touching on people's shared experience. Where are places in your life where you feel like it's hard for you to break out of the circumstance you're in? You know, where do you see that the system tends to make it hard for you? And especially for a lot of blue-collar white folks today, that's something that they can relate to. 
And then we can step back from there once people feel listened to and heard and they understand that you sense that they too have challenges in life. Then from there, they're often much more open to listen to how those challenges might show up even more for somebody who's of a racial group that's been discriminated against. So there's no, there's no uh, easy way to do this. There's no definite way that's going to work all the time, but we have to keep looking for where the doors open. One of the things I'm concerned about right now is that a lot of the conversation that we've had about things like white fragility and things like this, even though the concepts are grounded, um, they, they tend to pathologize people and make people feel like you're telling them they're wrong for feeling nervous. And, um, and then they'll shut down even more. So we, we keep looking for that, um, the right language to use with different audiences to either advance the conversation because what we want, we don't want to incite folks. We want to invite them into the mm -hmm. conversation. So we continue to look for what that looks like across, um, across the state of Colorado and across the many constituencies that we engage in. But I, go ahead, Sister Dr. Karen, I had a recent experience that um, has some relevancy to, to what we're discussing. I was in a situation with, and I can talk about this because it's been talked about in the public media. I was in a situation with the first lady, we prefer the first sister of Washington, D.C., Cora Masters Berry, and Carly Fiorina. It was a situation of two women who identify as Democrats, and Carly, who not only identifies as a Republican, but she ran, in fact, for the highest office. We began by saying to each other, we do not agree on everything. In fact, the list would probably be pretty long. But what is it that we do agree on? And when we each could say we agree, especially in this setting, that voter suppression challenges our very democracy. We could talk about a lot. And so at this period in our country and our lives, and there's so much divisiveness, if we could just keep trying to begin with, let's talk about what we do agree about and see if that helps us to be more understanding about we don't, about what we don't agree on. Now, one of, thank you, thank you both for that. You've reinforced what we have been uh, thinking and trying to do here at the Colorado Health Foundation. We had a question from someone online with vaccine mandates now being the topic of the day. Are there and what are the equity considerations that you see as more and more organizations mandate vaccines for their employees? Mm. I love when I can turn to my bro and say, you go first, because it's a tough question. You go <laughs> first, bro. Okay. Now I'm having, I'm, I'm hearing the Sith, so uh, if I cover some covered, bear with me. Um, I think that the is about this. I think, first of all, we live in a society in which we make constant determinations uh, that the needs of the many are more important than the needs of the few. We have stoplights, for example. You know, we have stop signs. We, we agree not to put our children in school if they haven't been vaccinated with certain childhood, easily child, communicable childhood diseases. Uh, we say that people can't walk around the streets naked or, you know, go to the bathroom in the streets. You know, there are lots of things that we do. So I think, first of all, we have to put aside this notion that there's something radically different about us that we've decided at the good of our society, everybody needs to participate in this. And that's something we've done repeatedly for decades and decades and decades. Having said that, of course, one of the great challenges that many people face 
are issues of access, how easy it is to get uh, the vaccine, to find the vaccine, um, uh, how easily how easily you could take off work to get the vaccine. Um, you know, many different issues. Do you have somebody who can explain it to you? Are you in a situation where you've got health care available, easily available to you, so that if you have concerns, a doctor can talk you through that and help you get through it? You know, and so once again, all the aspects of our system, and we know that health care has always um, been an issue uh, where race is concerned. Uh, Dr. Cole mentioned earlier that saying about, you know, when white America gets a cold, black America gets walking pneumonia. Uh, but besides that, we know that there are health disparities in virtually every major disease uh, that, that black people tend to get sick frequently more than white people and tend to die more from them more than white people. And so it's and, and all of the factors that lead to that are the same factors that make it difficult to get the vaccination to people. So we've got to take this on, not just as a, a mechanical medical issue, here's the vaccination, come get it, but we have to take it on as a social impact issue to look at how do we make sure to get out into communities, get the right people out in communities, enroll people who can who are trusted to communicate with people. Um, that may be pastors of churches or teachers in schools or people who run health clinics, um, you know, whoever, who people have already developed trust for who can say, this is a government program you can trust. Um, and so um, I think it's, it, it's going to require broad thinking for us to make sure to reach people. And obviously, there's a lot at stake. So Dr. Cole, I'll put you on the spot. If you were um, still president of Bennett or Spellman, would you be mandating the vaccine for employees and staff and or students? The answer is yes. Because not to do so would put all in the Bennett or Spelman College community at risk. We do ask of ourselves and each other the things that are just rock bottom important. I mean, the thing that pops in my head right now I didn't hear my bro, so he may have used this example. But you know, we require everybody to stop at a red light. I'm sure there are people in beefed up cars, you know, and they would just as soon go straight through the red light. But in the interest of the health of everyone, we say stop at a red light. In the interest of everyone, were I the president at Spell or Bennett, I would say, and I'd say please, but it would be a pretty clear requirement. <laughs> Get yourself vaccinated. Wear a mask. It will not only protect you, it will protect people you say that you love. Thank you. I'm gonna shift our conversation a little bit and, and start talking about the way forward. So how do, we, how do we bring belonging into a divided community, a divided state, a divided nation? How do we start bringing belonging and inclusion and kinship to our communities? So, you asking me first, or? Yeah, sure, either of you. <laughs> I'm sorry, once again, you, you I'm not get, hearing Dr. Cole when a, she's speaking, so I'm gonna go chance, ahead and respond. You, you finally yeah. get a chance, Howard, to say, sis, you go first. All right, good. You wanna go first? <laughs> sure, why not, why not? And by the way, to the sisters and brothers in this convening, we made you all sisters and brothers because we assume again that we all share the basic value of human rights. Okay, so the question is, how do we do better in the ways that are important in the lives of all of us? That is, how do we do better in treating each other minimally with respect and with dignity. Well, my bro wrote a book called Belonging. 
And I had the great honor, really, of writing the forward to the The first thing I need to say before Howard speaks on this topic that he knows a lot about, I have to say this is tough work. This is not what you kind of get up in the morning and say, well, today I think I will interact with 18 people who view the world differently from the way I will, and we'll just make it go away, all of our differences. And yet, despite how tough it is, we have to keep trying. If we don't, then we begin to live in a country that consists of hundreds of different countries. There are ways in which we just have to use good old common sense. I would say even use the things that some might say are all, you know, kind of schmaltzy and, and fuzzy and warm. But why not begin talking about how your, I don't want to call this person my, well, let's just put it this way. Begin the conversation around some issues that you have a good chance of believing you might find copyright. For example, how do you look that? What does that mean to you? Now, I know that that conversation is going in my head in the direction of, well, we have a family member who's now declaring herself to be a lesbian, in which case there's going to be some contest. But when we talk about family, something that we care about, something that we want to protect, that's some common ground. I think that is another topic where you can find common ground. Whoever the individual is that I'm talking to, I think it would be pretty hard for them to take the position. You know, I just think fitness ought to be part of life for everybody, and if you aren't having it, go find it. And so by beginning with such such important uh, topics, maybe you begin to build a sense of empathy. If there is anything that I wish we could clone and spread around our country and our world, it would be empathy, the ability, the human ability to understand somebody else. Thank you. All right. Mm. Howard. Yeah. I, what's the way forward? Again, I hear everything Dr. said, but uh, say, um, in my own experience, you know, I think, I sense Dr. Cole may have been saying this because I caught a couple words here or there, but when I wrote our search for belonging, I went out and interviewed over 100 people who voted for President Trump which was the opposite of my politics. Um, and I did it because I wanted to really understand who people were and where they were coming from. And, and what I discovered was that, like most groups of people, um, that they didn't fit the cartoon picture. You know, that there were some people who were the people who we often see depicted on TV with the MAGA hats and, you know, cheering at the rallies and signs and all that stuff. But there were also a lot of people who were very troubled by some of the things I was troubled by, but just felt for political reasons they couldn't vote that way or, or they could not vote that way. Um, there were other people who had specific issues that were really important to them, of specific political issues that they didn't feel they could vote against. Um, and, and, you know, what I came away feeling was not that um, any less strongly about my particular positions on the issues, because I think we all, you know, have a right to our positions on the issues, however strongly we feel about them. But what I try to do is to remember that my positions on the issue, my point of view on the issues are, in fact, a point of view. 
Um, and so are other people's points of view. That, that doesn't mean that I think that their point of view is as valid as mine, because obviously we always think our point of view is more valid. But I did begin to realize that in their minds it was just as valid, and that there were very few people who I'd run into who came across with the kind of egregious negative orientation. For, for many of them, it was because they felt like they had to do what they had to do for their family. A young woman who told me she homeschools her children and she just didn't believe that Hillary was strong enough on homeschooling. Uh, somebody else who believed in, uh, uh, who did not believe in abortion or right to choose, you know, people like that. Um, and so what I try to do is to do a lot more listening um, than I do talking a lot of times in these kinds of conversations and to really get a frame of reference people are coming from and also they can feel this too, so that they're much more likely to be open to input. And I find that the more I do that, the more I honor the humanity in people, even while I disagree with their politics, the more I try to honor the humanity in them to remember that they have husbands and wives and partners. They have children who they worry about. They have older people who they have to take care of in their lives, just like I do, um, that I can separate the point of view that I disagree with from the humanity of the individual. And I think that our path forward is really built on that. I think when we realize that we're all in this together, you know, we're all in this lifeboat together and shooting holes through the other side of the other person's lifeboat does not keep it floating in the water. Now, that doesn't mean that I I'm afraid to have a strong point of view or get into a strong debate. In fact, some of the people I get into the strongest debates with are people who I respect enough to really let them know how I feel and vice versa. Um, and I think we, a lot of us see that. You know, we have, the, we have the worst fights always with our partners or our spouses. I mean, that's, you know, when we get angry with each other, we kind of let it fly because we know we're in it together. So I do think that the more we can listen to each other, the more we can honor the humanity in each other, even as we disagree with people's points of view, um, the better off we'll be. Now, having said that, I think we have to keep in mind James Baldwin's wonderful quote when he says that we can disagree and still love each other as long as your disagreement is not rooted in the denial of my humanity. Um, or my right to live. Um, said more simply, there are no both sides when one side is genocide. Um, that, that being said, I think there are a broad range of people who are not that extreme, who are really aching to connect from both sides. And the more we build that middle, the more we build those people who are willing to share in our humanity, willing to sit with each other, really listen to each other, the less people on the extremes will drive us. So what do you think, or what is the role of allyship, um, activism, and, or uh, accompli being an accomplice. What's the role there in helping us, helping the, get us the, the way forward? Dr. Cole. You've just used a description of a, of a way of behaving that I want to affirm. I think that allyship, or perhaps you could call it being an advocate, um, that this is a wonderfully human way that we can move on. Now, having said human way, there are lots of experiments that really show primates and other animals taking a stand for each other. And so, since we're supposed to be at the top of this way of being a being, surely we can do this. Allyship can be as simple as talking with someone who you know is being treated poorly because of some identity. And just person to person saying, I want you to know that I really stand in opposition to what you just experienced or what you are experiencing. That, that's not asking too much of us. But allyship, it seems to me, can go further. It can mean that you not only indicate to a colleague, to a friend, that you 
that you understand their hurt. Allyship can actually include your intervention. Let me give a simple example. Back in the days when we were not all working at home, but in offices, imagine someone hearing someone else say to a colleague, oh, don't say that, you're sounding like a sissy. You gotta intervene there. It's not just the individual who's being harmed by such a term. It's that I would feel harmed. And so in such a situation, I think an ally has a responsibility to say, excuse me, I don't think you meant any harm, but I want you to know that for me and for others that I know, the term sissy is a derogatory term. And I can even say it's a term I grew up hearing in the South in my youth. My husband is not nearby, but if he were, he would hear me share something that he did yesterday. He was in a conversation with an African-American man who used the expression, but of course I can Jew him down. And rather than walking away, my husband tells me that he took the time to explain to this young brother why the, why the term Jew him down is profoundly offensive. The young man took it and he said, I can promise you I will remove that word from my vocabulary. So I'm trying to, to say as best I can, you know, allyship isn't about you know, putting on armor and getting on the horse and riding away to defend your friend. It's simple acts, simple acts that each of us has a responsibility to do. Thank you. And Howard, as you respond, um, let's take it up to the institutional and, and societal level. What, how do we create um, organizational allies? How do we create policymaker allies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there's, um, there's a really important distinction here between allyship and helplessness. Allyship um, and what? We missed that word. Helpership. Helpership, okay. In other words, sometimes sometimes we think, and, and this is, you know, to be honest, this is sort of the white liberal's curse. Sometimes we come into situations with the best of intentions thinking we're going to help these poor folks who need our help. And we don't even realize that when we create that kind of relationship, we're maintaining that same power relationship that was always there before. I'm in the position to help, you're in the position to need help. Now, I'm not suggesting that people don't need help sometimes. We all need help sometimes in lots of different ways. Sometimes it's material and sometimes it's emotional and sometimes it's, it's you know, ontological. I mean, there are lots of different ways we, we all need help. But there's something very different about standing next to somebody arm in arm and saying, we're in this together. And so I think one of the most important things that we have to do in organizations in order to generate that kind of allyship is um, from the, from the uh, perspective of the leadership of the organization to make it clear to people why equity in our organization serves the organization, why people being treated fairly with as limited amount of bias as we can have serves our organization and serves everybody in it. Why our ability to be sensitive to culture helps us in an increasingly multicultural marketplace and serves the organization and everybody in it. Because So, so I think everything we do organizationally around uh, allyship starts with that because that's the fundamental communication. That's to say, if you don't do your part to help them 
and to serve them and have make sure they have an equitable shot, then we are all going to suffer for that. Our organization on the whole is going to suffer for that. And I think that that's the most critical message that we can that we can generate as a, as a ground of being for our allyship programs. Now, having said that, I think allyship is like anything else that we can learn to do better or to do worse. Um, we can learn to do it better by um, get, being given some listening skills, by giving some opportunities to come together uh, and really understand each other. Uh, one of our dear friends, uh, Dr. Coles, and my dear friends, Caroline Wanga, who who um, is now with Essence Magazine, but before that she was the chief diversity officer for Target. And when um, when the, a lot of the anti-Muslim uh, stuff was rising in 2016, 2017, she pulled several hundred people into a room and said, let's talk about how this feels. Let's listen to how it feels to our Muslim uh, co-workers here, and let's listen to how other people are feeling. Let's get this fear up on the table to look at and listen to, and then let's look at how do we resolve this together. I think that's the kind of mindset that we have to have. And if you can't get some of the people on the edges who are really extreme, then start with the people in the middle. Then start with the people who are inclined towards wanting to listen to each other and wanting to understand each other, and then have it become the way of being around this organization. Allyship leads the way, and if you're not on that train, you're going to like left behind. And this is what we really want to do. We want to build on the natural human tendency to want to get along with groups that we're a part of. And if we can make the ethos of our group an ethos that's built on allyship, then people, will, most people, will want to go along with that. And frankly, people who don't want to go along with it more times than not start to quiet down a little bit about their resistance because they know that it's not welcomed in the organization. You know, um, no. right shortly after, or congruent or um, parallel to the time of George Floyd's death, George Floyd's murder, uh, and the, some of, and all the marches and the racial unrest, many corporations positioned themselves publicly as allies. Everybody came out with these great statements and what they were going to do and how they were going to show uh, commitment to racial justice and equity. What's your prediction about um, what kind of follow through we're going to see from those promises? I would quickly respond by saying. We have a responsibility, those of us who didn't issue those big statements, those of us who are not on that list of corporations that say they're going to really now work in the interests of diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. We have a responsibility to hold those corporate CEOs to stick to what they said. And we know that in some situations, that's not happening. Corporations that said, for example, we will not continue to donate to the campaigns of individuals, rather, of companies who participated in some way in saying the insurrection on January 6th was really not an insurrection. And remember, some people have said it was a bunch of patriots protecting their country. And so we have to, we have to hold each other accountable. I can say here, because it's going to make it public, that I'm a part of an organization of Black women. It's not a single organization. It's the coming together of Black women leaders. We are going to write a letter asking the corporations who stood up and spoke out to stick to what they said. It's so easy in that moment of, of incredible terror. I mean, watching watching George Floyd lose his life in the way that he did will forever remind me of a lynching. And so emotions were high. I think it was relatively easy for corporate leaders to say, we're going to do this and that and the other in response. But now that there's a kind of slowing down of the emotions, 
Folks seem to be forgetting what they said they would do. So I'm glad I'm giving myself a warning. Since I'm supposed to help draft that letter, we've got to hold corporate America accountable. Because all we're really asking them to do, and Howard made this point earlier, we're asking them to act in their own interests. That's what we mean when we repetitively say there's a moral case for diversity and inclusion. But there's a business case. If you think your business is doing well now, why don't you do better at diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, and watch your business go through the roof in terms of profitability? And so I understand, I can easily understand, that over the course of these 401 years, of racial terror and oppression that given the length of time it has happened, it is really very easy, except for the, those who are the victims of it, a folk to almost act as if this is just the way it is. I mean, you know, black people live in a lot of substandard housing. That's just the way it is. Black children go to schools based on zip code, which means they receive inferior teaching and possibilities of learning. Black women make huh, a whole lot less than any white man for doing the same job. That's just the way it is. Well, if it is the way it is, we have got to figure out how not to do it. Thank you. Howard, I'm gonna ask you a very, before I get to my last question, I'm gonna ask you a very practical question on behalf of everybody that's listening. But we've got a lot of uh, executive directors, CEOs of nonprofits. It is my contention that um, every body and their mother has now hung out a, a shingle as a diversity consultant. How, does, how can our colleagues choose a good one? Because I think for every good one, there's about 25 bad ones. So how do you pick the good one? Well, yeah, I mean, actually, before I get there, if I could just take just a moment sure. to talk about the last question, because I think it's really important. And the reason I want to do this, because I want to give a shout out to the fact that there are a lot of companies out there who are doing really great work and who have taken their promise after George Floyd's lynching um, really seriously. There, are, of course, there are some who are have practiced what uh, some of my younger colleagues call performative wokeness, you know, like putting a Black Lives Matter sticker on your Mercedes and thinking that does it. Yes. There are plenty of those, but there are some who are doing well. And I think that the organizations that are doing well around this and keep the work going are organizations who are values driven. They're, they're, they're driven by their fundamental values. They're not putting their finger up here and say, all right, the wind is blowing towards Black Lives Matter now, so we're going to be for Black Lives Matter. But as soon as the wind blows against critical race theory, we're going to come out and say, uh-oh, maybe we shouldn't have been doing that. And then we're going to bounce back when the next terrible incident happens. And these are the kinds of things that makes employees more and more get frustrated. So so I do, I do want to honor those who are doing the work rigorously, but to say we've got a long way to go with a lot of people who felt like just signing their name or putting that bumper sticker up was enough. Now, again, back to your question. Um, first of all, I think I'm not sure that I would agree that for every one good one, there's 25 bad ones. I think that it's there are a lot of people who are well-intentioned in this space, but don't really have a sophisticated understanding of what it means to be a diversity consultant. I think being a diversity consultant, we wear multiple hats. We have to understand the content, of course. 
We also have to have done enough work on ourselves so that our stuff doesn't get in the way of the work. Plus, we have to have an understanding of how to create organizational change, which is a whole separate, a separate skill set, because you can understand diversity to the core of your being, but be completely ignorant about organizational change and not be able to sell anything through the organization. So, so I think what you want to be looking for are people who, who seem to have um, a personality that is grounded and, and solid. You get a sense of um, equanimity from them. You don't get a sense that they're a strong reactive personality type in either direction, um, that, there's, that there's a steadiness and a solidity there, that they've got, got a strong understanding of the content of the material as it applies particularly for your organization. So, for example, as healthcare providers, you want to be sure that you've got somebody who has some experience in healthcare because the particular distinctions of diversity as it applies to healthcare are different than in lots of other places. Um, for some people who are international organizations, um, that's a dynamic. Do people understand how to translate diversity work into the language of different countries and cultures? Because a lot of times U.S. diversity people go to other places in the world and fall flat because they're not able to make that translation because our particular flavor of diversity is different from others. And so I think I think that's a big component. And that there that there are people who know how to work in an organization and they know how to make things move like. What are the levers in an organization to create organizational change? And that means being able to relate to leaders and help and coach leaders, being able to create very clear systems and structures and know how to evaluate those systems and structures. So I think that, that the, the sort of the totality of those three legs of the stool are what I invite people to look for. Thank you. We are quickly running out of time, so let me ask one last question. You both have been um, soldiering for racial justice for decades. Um, why, why are you still soldiering? What keeps you going? And then before, the session before, I was asked the question, what song is my go-to song when, when I'm, um, what's been my go-to song during COVID? And I said it was Sam Cooke's, The Change Is Gonna Come. Mm -hmm. So why are you keep soldiering and what's the change you keep soldiering for? Sis, you've been doing Excellent. it for longer. I'll let you go first. I stay in the movement for social justice because I can't imagine the antithesis of that. I, in the eighth decade of my life, I'm still an activist because I believe in freedom and equality and justice. And as Ella Baker said, Ella Baker, one of our extraordinary soldiers in the civil rights movement, she once said, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. And Bernice Johnson, Regan, and Sweet Honey in the Rock put it into a song. It's called Ella's Song. Mm -hmm. That's the song I listen to if I dare to assume that we can't do better than this. And the reason I say that is, look at the first word, we. It's not just myself. That song, Ella's song, reminds me that I am one among countless others who believe that we can do better, who believe that Freedom is, is possible. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Howard, you get mm. last word. Oh, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having us. Sorry that we had the technical difficulty, but it's been a real uh, privilege to be with you all. Um, you know, I have no problem staying motivated because I grew up in the shadow of having a family that was murdered because we were different. And so it's really clear to me the cost. And I also grew up in a family in which we were told you're supposed to do something about it. So it was something that I was born and set out in the world to do. Um, having said that, 
there are lots of times when it feels discouraging. And there are lots of times when it feels like, oh, my God, are we back here again? And, and at those times, the, the thing that I remember the most is a quote that I heard many, many years ago from a guy named I.F. Stone, who was a writer back in the 60s. And he wrote for The Village Voice back in the 60s. And he said, if you expect to see the fruits of your labor in your own lifetime, you're not asking a big enough question. Um, and, and for me, that's what keeps me going. I know that I will never see in my lifetime this played out to the level that I would like to see it played out. I know we will not achieve, but we're not likely to achieve full equality in the next 20 or 30 years or however long I have on the planet. So I think of my children and my grandchildren, four of my six grandchildren are of mixed race. You know, I think of their world and of their children's world. And so that's what gets me out of the bed in the morning. Um, whether I'm doing it professionally, you know, as a, as a speaker, as a consultant, or whether I'm doing it when I'm talking to people in my community or when I'm on um, uh, social media or something, that our job is always to move the needle. In every conversation, how can we move the needle? And if I rest my head on my pillow at the end of the day and feel like that I've done something to move the needle, then I can feel like that's enough to get me up the next morning and go again. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you, you for your lifetime of work. Thank you for your, your passion. Thank you for your commitment. And, and for the last hour, thank you for your patience and graciousness. <laughs> thank you so much. It was much. a joy to be in this conversation. Bye-bye. Stay safe and be well, everybody. Thank you. You all, too.